you're right. The eight billion to, to the Taliban is a. Um, it's it's almost as if we're 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 it's a it's not extortion. What is it? It's bribery. We're almost like saying here, take this, and don't don't you know don't do anything. Right? Don't cause us any trouble. How can I help? How can I be useful in ending needless suffering? Do not be afraid of work that has no end. We have to organize a social movement. We have an opportunity to lead by example versus just talking, hot air. I think the more people in this fight, the more we grow. Eventually you could change. You know, the people are the ones that can make the change. Welcome back, everybody, to Change Agents, an ironclad original, proudly presented by our friends at Montana Knife Company. Today's episode is timely for a few reasons. One, the situation in Israel. Originally planned to be talking about the Taliban, Afghanistan, the withdrawal, what's left behind, and the potential for Taliban to be taking Western money and what they're doing with it. I say it's timely because there's an unavoidable tie-in between our departure, both of personnel and the infrastructure left behind, and potentially what is happening in Israel currently. My guest today is Mike Baker. Mike spent nearly 20 years as a CIA covert field operations officer. He took part in counterterrorism operations, counter narcotic operations, counter insurgency operations, all of the isms all around the globe. He currently is the CEO of the Portman Square Group, a global investigative and strategic communications company, and is the host of Black Files Declassified on Discovery Channel and a new podcast, The President's Daily Brief. He is the author of the book Company Rules, or Everything I Know I Learned About Business from the CIA, and he is a wealth of knowledge in not only this area, but in the intelligence infrastructure, the intelligence community, and conflicts like this around the world. Enjoy. There are concerns that weapons left behind in Afghanistan potentially made their way to Hamas and were used in what's currently going on right now between... Uh, Israel and Hamas, the the specifically Gaza Strip. What are your thoughts on that? You think that's possible or plausible? Uh, yeah, a couple of things. One is is uh, is look, I'm old enough that I remember when we we, we were told that the next thing we have to do uh, now that we've gotten the Soviets, the old you know Soviets out, out of Afghanistan back in the day, was to go back and and try to you know clean up and collect all those uh, stingers. Uh, that good luck with that. Had, had helped the <laughs> Mujahideen team get rid of the Soviets, and so now we're worried that some of those that well could be uh, back in or, you know service in the Middle East. Uh, it all kind of goes around and comes around, I guess. But um, yeah, I see it as as possible. I spent some time uh, dealing in the gray arms. Uh, market. Uh, no, I didn't. I wasn't dealing with it. We yeah. were addressing the uh, the problems in the great arms market, and uh, it's robust, as you know. It's it, and so the idea that you could get, um, you know, gear moved around uh, the world to various hot spots, and the idea that there may be liaison uh, officers in between some of these groups. Uh, look, whether it's Al Qaeda and, and the Sinaloa cartel, or whether it's you know uh, ISIS and 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 you know Islamic Jihad or whomever there there are contacts. It's a it's you know they don't all completely operate in a bubble. So yeah, I I, I think it is a possibility. I think a lot of what they do is homegrown. Uh, that you know comes from the training and the technical support that they get from Iran. Iran's the biggest problem, and as far as I'm concerned, the current administration. Not to get overly political, but they seem to be at pains to say that Iran is responsible for Hamas. Um, in part because they've been so keen to get back into a deal with Iran. I think they're afraid of the optic uh, yeah. of spending three years or so being soft on Iran in a sense, and now Iran being responsible for this atrocity and, and this war that's building. Yeah, it's having spent a good amount of my life bouncing back and forth 
uh, you know, between Afghanistan and Iraq. I don't think people realize actually how, from a geographic perspective, how closely located a lot of these countries are. You know, the neighboring, you know, Iran, where it sits, you know, Pakistan on the eastern side of Afghanistan and continuing west, and you're going to eventually arrive, you know, in Israel and in the Gaza Strip as well. And I also don't think people realize the undescribable amount of equipment and infrastructure that we left behind in Afghanistan. Yeah. Whether it be arming our, you know, our partner force at the time or our allies at the time, however you would want to phrase it, I, I personally witnessed that from them going from basically being unarmed to moderately well equipped. I wouldn't say necessarily a first world army, but probably knocking at the door mm -hmm. at that. And then, can you, you know, from your, I, I have a, a, a literal boots on the ground understanding of both of those countries, not an operational or strategic level understanding by any stretch. I don't claim that. But could you paint a picture of what was left when we actually pulled out of Afghanistan? And I'm curious as to your thoughts on yeah. how we actually, the execution of said withdrawal. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I, as by way of a couple of examples, uh, we had in Iraq, we got into Iraq in, in uh, just at the very outset uh, in 2003 uh, of our, you know, moving in there. And, and in part because at the time we were doing some work on behalf of some uh, what would become infrastructure companies, right, that, that were out in Iraq for years. And we've been doing some work on their behalf elsewhere. And so anyway, we ended up there at the very uh, outset. And, you know, it, it was... It was striking, even before things turned to shit, you know, back in September or so of 03, when it, you could start to see it getting sideways. Um, you know, you could stroll into any open air market <laughs> and buy an amazing array of hardware, right? And this was, you know, this was early days in Iraq, and it was just, it was, it was surprising, you know, at that point, uh, because you felt like, okay, well, you know, yeah, it's 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 the Wild West in a sense, but, you know, it, it got worse down the road. It wasn't quite as open, but it was like going into Walmart and being able to buy just about anything that you wanted on the on the military hardware side. So, you know, first of all, I guess the point of that story is that in that part of the world, you know, gear is just it just is available it just floats around it's 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 like it's like trading in a commodity right and nobody finds it surprising because there's so much conflict there's so much tribal uh you know uh conflict that goes on as, as you know on one level not to you know, even talk about the terrorist side of things but it's it's there and it's available so you, you transfer that over to afghanistan and, and afghanistan is, is it's actually even worse right because they've uh they've been you know battling each other and, and others you know forever and so uh, but I, I think the the notion in in a sense of of afghanistan and how we pulled out uh, there was a desperation right to to end this right and and people were fatigued people were fatigued you know 10 years before that but but just people didn't want to think about it. They didn't want to pay attention to it. They were done. And the Biden administration, I think, read that as, you know, politically, this is the way to go. This is this is what we should do. This is beneficial in a sense for us to just, you know, shut the screen door and, and walk away. And there was no legitimate uh, analysis or thought given to what that meant, right? There was no, it, it, we, they, we, it was almost as if they believed this notion that we had to appease the Taliban by sticking to some arbitrary or imaginary timeline. It was, it was the most absurd, ineffective, disgusting, you know, process. There was no, again, I don't know where the leadership went. The idea that there was, there was going to be something stable left behind. We knew that from the Soviet days, right? We yeah. knew that the Soviets spent the last five years of their occupation trying to get the hell out because they couldn't, they couldn't control it. They made this, their problems were the same problems we had. And we knew that. And yet we, we thought somehow we were, we were going to do it better. And so this notion that, you know, we had intelligence and we, we had assessments talking about, 
you know, the, the, how stable the Afghan army was and, and, you know, how long it might, you know, support um, a pseudo democratic government. It's just, it's absurd. There was just no way. They never bought what we were selling, the Afghan people. I mean, they didn't even know what we were selling, you know. So I, I don't know. It, it's depressing on one level because I saw the, again, old enough to have seen the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan. And yeah, history repeats itself. You just like to think it doesn't do it quite that quickly. Yeah. You know, one of the most disturbing things for me is people, it, it would be easy. And I do put responsibility on Biden because he was the person in the seat at the time continuing with that decision. But to think that what happened with our country and first off going there in the first place and then our eventual departure that only rides with Biden. So you're kind of forgetting what happened with Bush and then what happened with Obama yeah. and then what happened with Trump. And people oftentimes focus on only the elected official portion of that. I have read now quite a few reports of senior military officers giving their true thoughts when they thought they weren't mm. being recorded or when they thought that their true thoughts weren't being written down. And then the bullshit that they would go spew elsewhere, whether it be in uh, public facing or going before Congress. And nobody is holding those senior military leaders accountable. I can tell you as somebody, I, I peeked out, my rocket uh, hit an apex at 03. I was a lieutenant at my, uh, my absolute apex of my military career. And I could have given you a more accurate assessment of the capabilities and abilities of the uh, ANP, Afghan National Police, the ANA, the Afghan National Army, and all of the little splinter, splinter organizations that we created, propped up, and worked by, with, and through. And for people only listening, I'm using air quotes on that because to truly accomplish the mission that we were doing on paper, yes, we were doing by, with, and through. Let's just say the tactical execution on target Maybe they were corralled in a different area. Maybe they were just kind of looking over here in this direction. But not a single senior military officer stood up and did the right thing and told yeah. the fucking truth and turned in their caller device. And they all knew. If you spent time over there, you understood the realities. And the realities is not what was sold to the American people. It is so fucked. And I wish that more scrutiny was brought on those senior military officers because it's it's a combination of those things, right? They're the execution wing of our foreign policy. Yeah. There's the elected leaders and those at the highest level of the military. And and on, on the other hand, I get it because they leave being a four-star general and now they work at uh, Boston Dynamics or they work at Harris, right. you know, or not to, not to, I'm not speaking pejoratively about those two uh, companies. Those are just the first right. two that come to mind. Yeah, right. it's-, it's No, I, I mean, I think- there was there was a and you see again I you know just kind of looking at how things just always kind of come back around you know whether it was Vietnam or really you know uh, any conflict you get that all the time you get the you know what do they say in private and you know what do they then when they get up to the podium what are they telling the American public um, you know there was no I remember a conversation. It was, uh, I think it was 2000, and maybe it was 2003 or four. So it was a long time ago, right? But I remember talking about Afghanistan with a fellow who was a smart guy, right? He was teaching at, uh, at a university, had a military background, and older fellow. And, and uh, I was very skeptical, right? In part because because of that experience with the Soviets exiting Afghanistan and what took place afterwards and then watching all of that and then seeing what the papers were, you know, saying from the, from the Kremlin and, you know, we got all that paperwork, right? I mean, we know what, what the Soviet Union was, was uh, struggling with. Right. And so his point was, no, it'll be different this time. <laughs> and when you try to drill down and say, well, why is it going to be different? You know, it'd be like, well, because we're America and we, you know, try, and we, 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 you know, we, we have their best interests at heart and we're, we're bringing democracy and we're doing all these things. <laughs> and I, I, there was no way to shift them off this position. Like we were going to stand on the sidelines and throw, you know, chocolate bars and nylons to the, you know, the adoring crowds as we drove through the villages and it was all going to be good. And uh, I don't think there was ever a moment during the, you know, the, the Afghan conflict in particular where I thought, 
there's never a chance we're going to create a stable pseudo federal government here. It's never going to happen. And, you know, God bless, the, you know, everyone who wants to do right. Right. I do believe that that the U.S. tries for the right reasons, tries to do things right. I mean, there's not a lot of other countries out there of our scope and scale, you know, that would be at the top of the food chain and trying to do things for the betterment of the community. But, you know, we, we make mistakes and then we try to self-correct at times. But uh, the point was that there was never a moment, I think, where it seemed like it was going to actually work. And so we were just biding our time, looking for a way to get out. And I'll honest to God, I never thought we'd get out in that manner. I, I was surprised at the manner that we exited as well uh, in talking to quite a few friends, uh, same career field that I had had. The consensus is, you know, <clears throat> we still have we still have troops in Japan. We still have troops in Korea. We still have troops in a variety of positions throughout Europe. Now, they're not engaged in combat operations necessarily. They're there and they can, you know, it's it's smart to have a forward mobilized force. But I think, one, keeping Bagram as a stronghold and a very small, maybe sub 2,000, 1,500 people element there may have been a better call from a long-term perspective than just essentially abandoning that country and telling people, hey, do your best to get to the airport and uh, maybe we'll have room on an airport. Yeah, good luck. Yeah. Oh, God. No, I mean, just from, if nothing, for, if for no other reason than just operational security, right? Getting rid of Bagram, you know, before you were going to, you know, shut the door and leave was insane, right? Yeah. It, 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 you could do a, a risk and threat assessment, you know, you, and you would have seen that in the first day uh, of, and, it just that's why I say I'm just confused over where where the, the leadership, uh, you know, not so much even from a strategic perspective, but just from a on the ground operational perspective saying, no, you cannot do that. If you're if you're dead set on getting the hell out of here right now and you're just saying that's it, but then you've got to keep, you know, your most secure airfield operational, yeah. the most strategic I, I airfield in the region. Probably a good idea yeah. to keep that in the stable. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Who, I mean, I'm not sure how it got missed, but but it did. But you're right. So the, and then because it's Washington, D.C., yeah, there's never any consequences, whether yeah. it's for politicians or anyone else. Right. It, that That's why I always find it funny when people talk about, well, they've got an investigation going in D.C. up on Capitol Hill. They got starting an investigation. Oh, that's bullshit. Right? Washington, D.C. is where all investigations go to die. So, you know, you never get consequences really for anything anymore. People yeah. just don't expect it. Yeah. When the Taliban was trying to largely convince the world that they were a legitimate government, they were talking about how they intended to protect human rights and uh, not a, an organization historically known for such things. But I mean, who knows? People and organizations can evolve. <laughs> Curious your thoughts on uh, whether or not they've kept that promise. <laughs> yeah, uh, no. Um, <laughs> and nor. Nor should anybody who has a pulse and any level of common sense have expected them to. Um, but again, it kind of shows it shows the eagerness and the, the, the rabid desire that the administration had in getting out there, that they were willing to throw that line out there. Well, look, they've you know, they've they've given us some guarantees. Right. And, and one of them was this this notion of human rights, uh, women's rights, uh, education. Right. And none of that's held. Uh, it's not in their DNA. Look, I, you're right. People can change. People can evolve. But, you know, call me cynical. I've, I've been around long enough and seen enough crap to, to think that um, sometimes people don't change. And sometimes you have to take them at their word. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I think, um, I, I guess you could argue, I was about to say something, you know, kind of, I don't know, maybe it's not right to say it, but I didn't really give a crap in Afghanistan whether we built another road or improved the literacy rate by two or three or four percent. Right? What I was concerned about was national security for the U.S. And that's how we should address any overseas problem. Is it in the U.S. national security interests? We have to understand what those are then, right, um, to uh, to be engaged in a meaningful way in, in whatever part of the world or whatever crisis or global conflict we're talking about. And, 
you know, we do tactical operations really, really well. Uh, you are much better versed in all of that than I would ever be. But, um, you know, nation building, mm, that's a different animal. And you could argue we we felt bad for abandoning Afghanistan after the Soviets walked over the Friendship Bridge and closed their door. And so I think there were a lot of neocons who thought, well, if we just stayed, we wouldn't have had 9-11. And the reality is, no, if we just stayed, we would have had, you know, 20 years of shit leading up to 9-11, right? And yeah. it still would have happened. But that makes me like some cynical asshole. So <laughs> I guess whatever. I mean, I, I tell people that the U.S. military is very good at breaking shit. We're not good at putting Humpty Dumpty back together again. I think that's... Yeah. And, but also, yeah. I don't know if that's necessarily even the role of the military. You know, I think that's where the this blend of NGO organizations and the U.S. military, like there has to be there has to be both. The U.S. military is not designed right. to build From my understanding of the doctrine, which let me just tell everybody out there is incomplete. I understand my job. Well, <laughs> I don't understand the uh, doctrine of all the military. But, yeah, mm -hmm. it uh, it didn't surprise me. And I and I actually fall into the same category as you. You know, the roads, the infrastructure, the literacy rate, I think all of those things are important, but you have to put them on uh, you have to put them on a timeline and you'd have to invest as a country in such a long period of time to reap the benefits of sowing those particular seeds. And, you know, I, I think one of the maybe the, the, the bigger mistakes that we made as a country was the commitment shortly after 9-11. I mean, we came in there like a hammer and a, and a yep. relatively precise hammer. I don't believe that warfare can truly be that precise. But I mean, we kicked the shit out of the people that were directly involved and they were kind of on the mm -hmm. run. And I think one of the biggest strategic errors, which I was not consulted on by any way, shape and form, nor should I have been. <laughs> really? Yeah. Was that we <laughs> the occupation again, we can break things. We're not great at building. And I don't necessarily think occupation in a war zone like that is what we're what we're the best at. But now I worry, and I'm curious what your thoughts, you know, now that we're essentially completely out of that that country, do you think it could create an environment for, a, you know, a breeding ground of organizations like Al-Qaeda or ISIS or ISIL or whatever the soup du jour name of the week is? Yeah, I, I mean, I, it, uh, I, I do, uh, short answer, just because it's, you know, there's a certain level of chaos, and that's tends to be where those groups gravitate towards, right? Um, either to take advantage of it or to find safe haven and, you know, hunker down and, and rebuild. So, um, yeah, I think that f for Afghanistan, I think our, our, our problem is that when we went into Tora Bora, yeah, that was a, that was a solid uh, action, right? And we should have at that point turned to uh, the Taliban and said, if you allow this to happen again on your turf, we're going to come back and do this again, you know, maybe twofold. And then if you, you know, and, and if you allow others to use your sandbox as a, as a training ground, we'll come back and do it again. But the idea that we were going to, you know, do this nation building, you know, to prevent all future terrorism, uh, <laughs> I think it was, it was a flawed strategy. I mean, it's easy to say now in hindsight, right? I mean, yeah. I'm going to look at that and go, yeah, okay, maybe. But we had enough past experience and there's certainly enough case studies for Afghanistan to know that we were pushing a big rock up a hill and it probably wasn't going to ever get there. So I think uh, it is a problem. We have to, and that's why the administration spent so much time during the withdrawal talking about their, you know, their ability to look over the hill and see what's going to happen and know, look there, you know, and, and you can see what's uh, happening. It doesn't mean you know what the hell's going on. Doesn't mean you know what the hell's going on. I mean, it's, it's like, like it's like with what we've seen with Hamas, right? I yeah. mean, that's a, it's a, again here we go with another example, right? There was a an element of the Israeli government because they were in pretty big disarray, you know, leading up to the you know, Hamas attack, right? And and there was an element of the the government that had decided, well, look, what we have to do is we have to, you know, even though the Arab world hasn't done shit for the Palestinian cause, right, for their own reasons. Um, and uh, I mean, you know, I don't know how many examples people need at this point, you know, because they all imagine this is an Israeli problem. No, you know, the Palestinian problem is a, is an Arab world problem, first and foremost. And then, yeah, the Israelis are sitting smack dab in the middle of it. So, you know, welcome to the party. But I mean, Jordan just came out and said, we're not taking any refugees. Are you crazy? Same as Egypt. Egypt's closed Rafa crossing. They're not taking any. Yeah. I mean, so, uh, 
anyway, but the but the point being is, yeah, yeah. To you, to your point, you can you can kind of watch what's happening. It doesn't give you the inside intel. You don't have anybody inside the tent. You don't have anybody even close. So it is hard, and 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 that sort of intel collection from a distance, no matter how good your technical capabilities are, is is a uh, very heavy lift. Uh, well, then there's the other aspect of. You know, the U.S. has spent about $8 billion in Afghanistan post-withdrawal. How do we know that that money, I mean, if we're giving the money to the Taliban, which is, mm -hmm. that's, an incredible, that's an incredible sentence to say, oh, hey, we're just going to give $8 billion to the Taliban. How can we, with any level of certainty, know that that money is going where we would, I mean, hope or even intend for it to go? Yeah, the answer is we can't. You know, and, and it was the same answer that for this ridiculous, you know, unfreezing of assets and somehow that six billion dollars wasn't going to be used for whatever purposes the clerics in Iran wanted for. The answer is, yeah, it, it will. And, you know, OK, Anthony Blinken and, and, you know, Treasury and others are right. Right. OK, you can only you can only access that money. You can't access it directly, but it can only be spent on medicine and food or whatever. You know, but if I'm the Iranian clerics, if I'm the regime and you give me six billion dollars and say you can only use it on medicine. Well, OK, great. Now I got six billion sitting in a pot somewhere else that I can spend on purveyors of terrorism, which is what they do. So, you know, giving money to the Taliban and, and, and expecting it to end up anywhere else, it's like giving money to Hamas directly. Right. Most of that, those resources that go into Gaza, you know, they end up being controlled by Hamas and Hamas decides what happens with them. Even the humanitarian aid, uh, much less money. Um, I mean, Hamas has funded maybe 90, 90 two, three, four percent by Iran. Um, but so, yeah, it's 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 depressing. It's uh, disgusting that, you know, we we like to kid ourselves and say we're giving all this money to the Taliban and they're spreading it around and building more schools and helping, you know, young girls get an education and, you know, treating everybody fairly. It's not happening. It's not going to happen. We just have to accept that fact, be a little more pragmatic, maybe, maybe learn a lesson from it for next time. How dare you? How dare you I, say I, that we should I, learn I, our lesson? I talk like this. I sound like such an asshole. I realize, I realize that. But anyway. Yeah, gosh. Good morning, everybody. As you know, Change Agents is an Ironclad original. But what you may not know is that for over a decade, Ironclad has worked with brands and individuals to create world-class films, series, podcasts, and ad campaigns. In fact, I've been working with Ironclad for the past few years. I was introduced to them on a project through the Navy SEAL Foundation. I've worked with them uh, on a variety of projects, even up here in Montana, long before they proposed the idea of change agents to me. They're the best in their field. And I say that because there are plenty of people out there looking for the best, looking for the cream of the crop, looking for the top of the triangle. And if you're looking for that, you need to look no further than Ironclad. If you ever need media by way of film, a series, podcasts, or ad campaigns, they have you covered. You can reach out today and follow them anywhere at This Is Ironclad, the ampersand, and then This Is Ironclad, or visit them online, thisisironclad.com. Again, www.thisisironclad.com. Ladies and gentlemen, I could not be more fired up to introduce the presenting sponsor for season two of Change Agents, Montana Knife Company, founded by somebody that I feel very fortunate to call a personal friend, Master Bladesmith, Josh Smith. Not only a Master Bladesmith, but the youngest Master Bladesmith and one of the most experienced in the world. Montana Knife Company blades are some of the finest that I've ever been able to get my hands on. They are the sharpest knife out of the box, and they're some of the easiest to resharpen when you dull the blade. I take them everywhere that I go. I have them in every vehicle that I own and every backpack that I ever take into the backcountry. Specifically, my favorite blade of theirs is the Speed Goat. It's lightweight, but so incredibly capable. I never leave home without it. If you're familiar with Montana Knife Company, you know it is often very difficult to get one of their blades because they sell out within minutes of being released. What you should be able to find in stock are the Blackfoot 2.0, Speedgoat, or a Stonewall Skinner. And if you use the code CHANGEAGENTS10, that's going to net you 10% off of your first order. Again, my personal favorite blade is the Speedgoat. If they have them in stock right now, don't mess around. Put it in your cart and complete the checkout. 
Montana Knife Company, they build working knives for working people. And like I said at the beginning, I could not be more proud to collaborate with them on Change Agents Season 2. What do you think life's like for the average Afghan now that we're gone, but, you know, still pumping billions of dollars? And with, of course, I mean, what was it, 48 hours after we withdrew? I think I saw the videos of the Blackhawks being flown and people hung underneath them. I mean, yeah. what, what yeah. do you estimate life is like for your average Afghan? Well, it, it, it's uh, if it hasn't been already terminated, it's pretty shitty for anybody who was viewed as, as helping the U.S. and its allies. Yeah. Right. So. Yeah, you know, it's ba basically a massive game of manhunt being conducted by the Taliban ever since we walked out the door. And retribution has been harsh and quick. And there are people still uh, hiding underground trying to figure out how to get the hell out with their families or, you know, so it's and then for everyone else, eh, I would argue it's pretty much like it was, you know, 100 years ago, or 50 years ago, whatever. You know, it's I don't think for the average Afghan you know, it, things have really changed that much. I think they, you, you know, I, I can't, it's hard for anybody in our position, right? We're so fortunate and so blessed and so lucky, right? When you, when you think about it, you know, you, you, you get born into a, into a country like this, you have opportunity. I mean, everybody's got different levels of opportunity and some people have shitty lives. There's no doubt about that, but you know, I, I can't even begin to pretend to understand how shitty it is for whether we're talking about Afghans well, we're talking about someone who's living in, in, in the Gaza um, and isn't associated or linked to Hamas. Um, but I suspect that, you know, they just you 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 just make do. Right. We don't even understand what that means. I mean, for the most part. Right. Yeah. I don't. What, what does it mean to collect fresh water every day? You know, to spend six hours, you know, trying to figure out what you're going to eat or feed your family with or how to get clean water. And that's an existence we can't even imagine. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not the best to, to answer the question about, you know, what life is like for the Afghans, I guess. But for the ones who were our allies. Oh, it's nothing good. Still stuck there. It's not good. Yeah. Uh, you know, unfortunately, I think a lot of people, when they hear the term eight billion dollars and, and they hear aid associated with that and it's being sent to Afghanistan. I think that most people, because they are compassionate and empathetic, that they would hope that that money is being spent on water sources or electricity or mm -hmm. infrastructure. And I just don't think that it is. What do you think? Do you think it would change anything if the U.S. stopped sending money to Afghanistan? Uh, I mean, there's no, the, glo there's the global they're, optic, they're, right? Like, oh, we're not yeah. going to support. But beyond that, yeah. but beyond yeah. that, from a, yeah, yeah. a, a no, logistical no. perspective, I wonder if it would actually have any change. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, you know, I suppose that, um, you know, look, you, you, you're trying to be optimistic. Some of that's got to filter down to the to the average person on the street, right? It can't, you know, it can't all get stuck in the Taliban logjam, but maybe it does. Um, but you take that money away. Look, it's, it's not going to be from a strategic perspective. If what we're doing is giving money to the Taliban because we want them to not be so heavily engaged in, in narcotics, right, as an example, um, it's not having that impact, right? It's not like the Taliban's giving up the narcotics trade. They're not giving up the narcotics trade. It's too, no. too lucrative. And, uh, you know, uh, is it going to encourage them to become more uh, civic-minded? Um, you know, what what is our purpose? I, I, I see, I don't know. I'm asking that question. I don't know what our reasoning is behind giving billions of dollars to the Taliban. I don't know what our strategic, you open that book and you go, oh, we're giving it for the following three reasons. Create what a stable government. Uh, keep them from uh, allowing their turf to be used by you know terrorist organizations. Um, you know, promote education amongst you know young people and women, girls in particular. I, none of that's happening. So I'd like to know. It's a great question. I'd like to know. Someone should explain why we're giving that money to the Taliban. What do we hope to gain from it? What's our objective? And then we could use metrics to determine whether we're meeting that objective. And if we're not. Then you know maybe we redirect that the, those monies. Well, I don't think anybody yeah. is going to. Uh, but, but but to your point, Andy, nobody's ever consulted with me on this. Yeah, <laughs> I I really don't think the people making those decisions are very interested in actual black and white metrics on whether or not the things that they hope were going to happen with that money are actually happening.
because that's a very difficult uh, argument to make. When you say eight billion, mm. no change, perhaps you know we could <laughs> reduce that to zero and invest that eight billion in our own com- country and in infrastructure, security, whatever mm. you would want to do with it, but somewhere here right. as opposed to, I mean. <sighs> Well, we're having that same discussion. I mean, look, it's it's all <laughs> flowing, right? Two yeah. billion is we got a two billion dollar aid package now, you know, for Israel, and I think everyone viscerally, everybody understands. Okay, yeah, we get it. Um, and you know, providing aid to Israel and you know is 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 something I think people understand on on a certain level, except for all the anti semites that you know are coming out of the woodwork. Yeah. Um, but then you got Ukraine, and you know, eighty plus billion. And I think the, the conversation up until the point where Hamas attacked, and now that conversation appears to have stopped, was, okay, can we have some transparency? What What is happening with that money? Can we account for it? Because, yeah, we, we can all agree, you know, someone should fire a rocket up Putin's ass, and we all want Ukraine to, to be victorious, and everybody's impressed with the level of courage and commitment they've shown, and the fact that the, the allies have stuck together as well as they have, but... I think in part because of the experience with Afghanistan, with Iraq, I think our our patience, that, that window, right, that time frame of patience in the U.S. anyway, has been compressed, right? 20 years in Afghanistan and now all of a sudden two years in the, in the Ukraine fighting the so well, the Russians, I keep yeah. saying the Soviets, the Russians. Um, now it's only two years before we're saying, what, you know, what are we doing? And that's an interesting dynamic, but I think there's, it's the same concept. Look, 8 billion to the Taliban, 80 billion to Ukraine. All the, the U.S. public, I think, would like to know is why, what's our objective? Make it very clear, right? Don't make it some esoteric, well, we're, we're fighting for freedom. Well, yeah, okay, fine. But what do you actually, yeah. what are your, what, what's your timeline? You couldn't get away with that in business. I know that for a fact. Yeah. We work with a lot of corporations. Or and go right back to our travel have... claims. We couldn't even submit yeah, for exactly. you know a yeah. certain amount of meals <laughs> above that. The scrutiny that they had over me at a JSOC command when it came to the amount of money I spent per day for meals. You know, if you're writing eighty billion dollar checks, even though I, metaphorically, I don't, I don't, I hope yeah, yeah, Biden's yeah, not yeah. Bottom, bottom lining actual checks. I've, but uh, <laughs> you know, I'll just say this. I, All right, here you it, go. Yeah, for anybody listening, I'm more than willing to be given eighty billion dollars with no oversight. If any organization is looking to do that, I accept this responsibility, and I will provide the same level of oversight that uh, we are as a country with the aid that we're giving to Ukraine. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't, but I, as a taxpayer, would love to know. And I don't even know if this yeah. is possible. Yeah. Wouldn't it be great to know where your actual tax dollars went? Fifty percent of your tax dollar went to this. Thirty percent of your tax dollars went to this. Like I would be, I was about to say I would be happier to pay my taxes. That's not the correct f- phrase <laughs> of that at all. I would be slightly more willing to pay my taxes if I had a better understanding yeah. and there was some accountability of what was done with that money. Because I swear we are acting as if we have this bottomless checking account and it's just John Hancock, John Hancock, John Hancock. Yeah, but. Well, that's what we're doing, and that is that is what what we are essentially doing. Look, if, I, I think the problem is, for the government's perspective, is if they if they provided a ledger book that says this is where your tax dollars go specifically, <laughs> not just some esoteric top line, you know, three percent goes to yeah. infrastructure or whatever. If they actually told you where your tax dollars go, I, I have a feeling everybody would march on D.C. with you know pitchforks and 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 uh, torches, um, if they still have pitchforks and torches. But uh, uh, so I can't think of a I, better I reason to do that then. If that would be the end result, perhaps yeah, that's I mean, a, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean it would be, it, it, but it's and it's you would imagine, right? But it's the same thing as, the, you know, the the U.S. citizen. I, sometimes you do wonder, right? I mean, look, we we're willing to send the same idiots to Congress, to the Senate, over and over and over again. Nancy Pelosi, eighty-three years old, just recently announced her her reelection bid. She's 83 years old. She's not, and she's not even the oldest. Yeah. Right. Chuck Grassley, all these others that are there. So I, I, there's an incurious nature, I think. I mean, it, it, to be fair, most Americans are just trying to get on with their lives, feed their kids, get, you know, get by, you know, do the things you need to do to, you know, hopefully have a good life. But, uh, Good God, the fact that we can't, you know, rustle up enough uh, interest and, and uh, desire to have term limits 
or yeah. insist on serious campaign finance reform, or like you said, know exactly where our damn tax dollars are going. How is that a tough thing, you know, for a curious invested American public? I think that our elected that, officials sometimes are driving people towards not being curious. I think they want to drive them towards, you know, focus on yourself and maybe even creating an environment where they're fighting for their survival so they can't thrive and have that extra bandwidth to ask those questions. I mean, yeah, put, putting the hat yeah, on if somebody- That's an interesting point. I yeah. mean, anyway, put, putting yeah. the hat on from somebody who's in that position who wants to stay in that position, I need to make people not pay attention. I got to make sure that they, they yeah. are so busy just trying to survive that there's no bandwidth for them to try to figure out what it is I may be doing or whether or not I'm acting in my own self-interest, which when you can be in politics for longer than you've been out of politics, which- far too many politicians are. How could you say that that yeah. is anything other than it's self-serving, especially when you look at the net worth? And I'm not against people making money. I hope everybody gets as fantastically right. wealthy as they want to be. But when you look at net worth of people before they enter politics and then the catastrophic leap forward on an average salary of about 200000 a year, I suck at math and I can kind of yeah. understand how that happens. It's like, oh, oh, and you got a board seat and you got another board. It's like, all right, motherfuckers. Absolutely. <laughs> Look, I got a couple of book deals, and now yeah. I'm a now I'm a TV contributor, and now I'm you know giving speeches, and and no, it's 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 absolutely true. Nobody wants to give that up once they get in there. Nobody wants to give that up because it's it's lucrative, it's it's easy. Uh, um, you're rarely questioned. You almost got a job for life. Look at Bob Menendez, right? You know, they go to his home, and he's got gold bars and cash. You know, fat stacks stuffed into his clothes. Who doesn't? Uh, though? I mean, come on. He's, he's who doesn't? Added. Yeah, who does? That's a good. That's a good point. Yeah, you're right. Never mind. I take that back yeah. as an example. I that keep mine bad. in the garage. Don't do it in the closet. Your temperature controlled garage. <laughs> oh, I got pallets of fat stacks just <laughs> everywhere. Uh, God, no, I know. I don't want to disappear down that rabbit hole, but it is a, it is a curious thing. But, but you're right. The eight billion to, to the Taliban is a. Um, it's, it's almost as if we're. We're, we're, it's a, it's not extortion. What is it? It's bribery. We're almost like saying here, take this, and don't don't you know don't do anything. Right? Don't cause us any trouble. It's right? to Just, save face. Let's, let's it's to say that we as yeah. a as a um, country still care. That's I mean that's really all it is. Right. Because they'll justify yeah. the yeah, eight yeah. billion. Oh, it's a fraction of the multi-trillion budget. Look how small it is. But at the end of the day, I, I worry that it is directly. Just that, you know, not, that area of the world, having spent some time there, as I know you have, it's mm. that money might land in one place, but where it ends up and what it is used for is anything other than probably than what the American people would want it to be used for. And right. they have no absolutely and they have no control over whether or not whether it becomes ten million or twelve million or it gets dropped down to zero. That's what that's also what sucks, is we have no control over what is done with that money. Yeah. No, and and, and despite you know, assurances, like I said, it's all fungible anyway. So yeah, yeah, you can, you can try to lock it down through treasury and, you know, through a variety of mechanisms and, you know, those can work to some degree, but it doesn't matter because you, you, now I got that, uh, if that frees up over here, yeah. you know, 8 billion, 6 billion or whatever the amount will be. And, you know, we've been doing that for, I mean, look with Iran, they, they eased up on sanctions and Iran is, it's that $6 billion of unfrozen assets. That's, that's a pittance compared to the amount of money that they've made in oil revenues since this, you know, the Biden administration, again, I, I you know, it's every administration's got its problems, right? For I'm sure. not, you know, I don't want to just be seen kicking one dog, but it's, uh, you know, the, the oil revenues allow Iran to engage in the shenanigans, right? And with Putin, it's the same way. When, when oil gets over $8 a barrel, Putin can afford his adventurism, right? Um, when when it's down around thirty five forty dollars a barrel, you know he's got to tighten the purse strings, and he doesn't have that ability, right? He can't afford it, and so we allowed Iran to you know start shoveling in the cash through their oil revenues, uh, in part because we're trying to say, well, look what we're doing. See, we're easing up, and now how about we get a deal? How about we get some sort of agreement, right? Agreement for what? Right? They've already said that their their entire purpose is to destroy Israel. Hamas has said the same thing, and that's because Hamas is a puppet, you know, controlled by Iran. So that, uh, what we're expecting, or what we're thinking, you know, when we're trying to negotiate a deal with Iran 
is, is beyond me. I don't, I don't understand. And again, not the Iranian population. Right? I, I, I know a, a, a lot of Iranians, fantastic people, great history, wonderful culture. I mean, it's an amazing place. But it's the, it's the regime uh, that needs to be dealt with at some point. You want to mitigate terrorism. You're never going to stamp it out. But you want to mitigate terrorism in that part of the world to some degree. That road's going to have to go right through the Iranian regime. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting. I don't know. Going back to the eight million, it begs an interesting question. <clears throat> you know, as a as a taxpayer, I have no control over or say on the amount of money that the U.S. government is sending to the Taliban. But I know that there are a lot mm-hmm. of Americans who are very empathetic and very compassionate to people who are still in Afghanistan, whether it was our allies or just the people still living there. And they they ask questions like, "Well, what can I do?" and you're almost pitting your efforts if you go through an NGO or another organization against the efforts of your country because we're paying the Taliban that much money. And then because we have no control over control over or insight into that, we're looking for other entities that are directly probably pitted up against the aligned and stated goals of the Taliban. You're almost fighting yourself. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, NGOs. You know, look, there's there's. It's a varying scale um, in terms of effectiveness uh, and and uh, ability to operate in, in challenging or hostile environments. So um, I've seen some NGOs and certainly personnel that work for them do some pretty incredible things around the world. But, uh, you know, look, they, they, they don't have the ability to, you know, direct uh, resources um, without the Taliban say so. Yeah. It's just not going to happen. You can't operate semi-independently inside of Afghanistan as an NGO to, you know, direct resources the way that you want them. That's not, it's, it's, it's naive to think so. So I, again, I think it all, it, it comes back around to the same thing we're talking about in part, you know, it's all about transparency and to what degree can the U S government be transparent in their, uh, you know, their uh, <laughs> spending of our money. And uh, apparently not that transparent is the answer. There's some yeah. rocket science for you. What uh, for people who who do still know where Afghanistan is on a map and care about what's going on over there? <laughs> do you have any resources or references that you would point them towards that you know of that could actually make a difference on the ground? Oh, God. Um, you know what? There was some there, there was some. Uh, elements that kind of came together uh, as the withdrawal was falling to shit. Um, but that, those were the, the ones that I know of were one time. Yeah. Uh, what can we do for individuals? What can we do for, you know, uh, small groups to help get them out of the country uh, in terms of, of now and any short to midterm uh, impact on what's happening on the ground in Afghanistan. I don't I, no. I, I'm sure. I'd like to think they exist, but I, I don't know them. I actually don't know of any off the top of my head either. And I, based on this conversation, I actually think the biggest impact that anybody in the United States could have towards Afghanistan would be to force accountability from our government and who we are funding and with what. I mean, that's a long term, yeah. so therefore never going to happen because it required attention span beyond 30 seconds. But, <laughs> I mean, it might actually be the most impactful <laughs> People, people listening to this conversation will be like, oh, fuck it. I'm so depressed. Well, that's what I was going to close with. I know we're running yeah. towards the end of our time. I'm curious, you know, so Israel has been and what's going on in Israel and the ties in between Hamas and Hezbollah and Iran and all the, everything going on there from a geographic perspective. Mm-hmm. It is it is easy, and I fall into this trap sometimes as well, to become bombarded and overwhelmed by what seems to be the impending World War Three. What mm. would you... What would you leave people with? I mean, what are you? What are your thoughts on the region? You can go as broadly or as narrowly as you want to, and I guess what would you? How would you recommend people think about global issues like this so it doesn't derail everything that's going on in their life locally? Yeah, that's a that's a really really interesting question, and and it also, I mean, on one level, I think you know we we've, we've all seen this everybody's gotten so, so partisan, right? It just seems like part of the problem in the U.S. is that 
is that we've got so many different ways of getting information now you know, part because of technology, but you've got so many different, but the problem is it hasn't done any good, right? Because yeah. all it's done is siloed, the, you know, the right and the left. And so now we sit in our trenches and throw hand grenades at each other. And and, and you can find exactly what you want. If you go onto the internet, you, you will find, find exactly the answer you're what looking you want. for. Yeah, it's exactly right. You can find exactly what you want and people do, right? Because uh, people want to be comfortable and they want to be agreed with and they want, you know, to, to read things that they go, yep, see, I was right. And so nobody ventures out into the into the middle ground anymore, right? Because you go, ah, fuck it, you know. Well, it, it, I mean, I, I see this all the time, right? Um, if I say something that's not, um, you know, like one side or the other, frankly, I, I, if you walk down the center, I guess is what I'm saying. So if you walk down the life. center, both sides hate you, right? <laughs> they, both sides are saying, oh, you're 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 just a dick, right? Because you're not agreeing with me. And what you're saying is, look, I, you know, the, the world's a little more complex than that. And uh, and I think we can all agree that, at least in the U.S., it's pretty dysfunctional right now. And so maybe what we should try is try to uh, make more noise in the center, right, and see if we can't figure that one out a little bit. But anyway, globally, I think it's in, in understanding, you know, what the world's like, it's probably the same as understanding what U.S., you know, politics and, and U.S. concerns and issues are, which is if if you're so inclined then you should read a variety of things. You should listen to a variety of things, right? Listen to stuff that makes you uncomfortable, right? You know, most people, they, they hear someone start talking and if they, as soon as they say something, if you're a Republican, they say something positive about the Biden administration, gosh, screw it. They, and they change it or they turn it off. And same for the left. You know, the left is just as, 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 uh, as insular as the right. Both sides are the same. And so I would encourage people to read as many different sources of information as possible and uh, and be willing to at least listen to other people's views without losing your shit, right? You can't, you can't have reason conversation. I've got, I got a lot of really great friends who are very progressive, right? And, you know, we have very interesting conversations and we don't get on each other, right? We just, we're just friends, right? They got one opinion, I got another. We go at it, and and but we don't go at it in an emotive, irrational way, right? And so, and and you can do that if you hopefully if you spend your time getting informed rather than just reading and getting your headlines from Twitter or whatever. Yeah. Um, which leads me to, to to mention that you know I am the host of the President's Daily Brief now. Uh, really? And that's a yeah, it's a podcast. It's available wherever you get your podcast stuff. Okay. And uh, I've been doing it for about five or six weeks and. It's only 20 minutes a day, but what we try to do is just take the key global issues of the day, much like you'd throw on the president's desk, the PDB. Yep. And, um, you know, you, you just look at the facts, you provide a little context, and then you let people get on with their day. Uh, but it's been, it's been a lot of fun so far. Um, but I find it um, really interesting because trying to keep politics out of it for the most part, look, I mean, you're never going to make it completely apolitical. It's just it's not realistic. But trying to just deliver facts, put some context in there, you know, occasionally maybe I'll let slip something, <laughs> but it can be difficult. Um, but yeah, I, I tend to be a fairly optimistic, even though it doesn't sound like it. You know, I think the U.S. is very resilient. You know, our democracy wasn't threatened by January 6th. It wasn't the worst thing since Pearl Harbor. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're much more resilient than that. I mean, if people genuinely think this country was going to be toppled, you know, by January 6th, then, you know, they maybe want to take a little more time and, and study history. Yeah. Uh, I think we're better than that. And, you know, that, but we, we do need to be careful and you always need to be watching out. And, you know, this, the country always takes work, right? It kind of goes back to what we talked about at the very beginning. It'd be nice if everybody was invested more in the country, right? If everybody spent a little more time you know, there's such a small percentage of people that have done what you've done um, in, in the military. You know, if you could even increase that by a small percentage, you know, I think it would have a significant change. I agree with you. On, on you know, the population. But anyway. If you, had a crystal, so if, to, if you had a crystal ball, how do you think the situation in Israel will play itself out? Um, I think... Uh, Look, Netanyahu talks about crushing Hamas. Um, you know, you know extremely well. 
you don't, you, it's not a zero sum game. Totally. You know, we're not going to get rid of terrorism or we're not going to get rid of a terrorist organization. They've got a bottomless well of recruits in part because, you know, at least from the Palestinian perspective, yeah, they live in a very shitty situation. They've been dealt an awful hand. I'm not talking about Hamas. I'm talking about just the citizens who are the residents who have to live in that environment and deal with it um, and are victimized by Hamas. You have to remember, Hamas doesn't care about dead Palestinians. Right? That's their currency. They know that what will happen is what's already happened. The narrative turns very quickly. You get Palestinians dying, and suddenly everybody forgets who initiated this. It was Hamas, and Hamas is controlled by Iran. And that's how this thing kicked off. And But yet the narrative now is, well, we've got to put pressure on Israel. Let's find a ceasefire. Right? White House is putting pressure on, on Israel right now. So how I think it will end, it won't end with the destruction of Hamas. Uh, I do believe they'll engage in... Uh, military incursions on the ground um, because there's a lot of targets they can't destroy. And I think they're also very keen to use the incursion opportunity to destroy some 300 miles of underground tunnels that exist under uh, Gaza that support Hamas's activities. Right? They use it for storage of weapons and stockpiles. They use it to move their personnel. Um, now they're using the tunnels to hide hostages. Uh, so I think that they're very keen to do that. But I think they'll also they'll they'll read the tea leaves and they'll do what always happens international condemnation because the number of palestinians dying because of hamas embedding themselves within the civilian population and they'll stop and they'll declare essentially a pragmatic victory and then back out and because the arab world doesn't care about palestine except for the palestinians except for how it meets their objectives and because iran last thing they need is stability in the region hamas doesn't want stability they're irrelevant without without instability same for hezbollah so we're not going to fix the problem. They'll back out, and it will be the status quo um, afterwards. And that's my best prediction. Yeah. It's not a happy prediction, but it's my best one. I think it's a very realistic prediction for sure, happy or not. <clears throat> I, I think oftentimes the truth is anything other than happy, and people don't want to provide it because of that reason. I don't know if that really mm. gets us much farther down the road. Um, I will let you <laughs> close it out, Mr. Baker. What do you want to leave people with? Uh, God, uh, I, you know what? Have a, <laughs> have a blessed life. Have a good life. Don't forget to, uh, you know, listen to man, Andy here, uh, pay attention. Uh, you gotta listen to people who have been through a lot of experiences and who have seen some shit. That's where you need to, you know, take your, uh, your insight from, uh, not some, you know, keyboard warrior sitting in a basement somewhere bitching about everything. Thank you for tuning in, everybody. I hope that you found today's episode to be, I'm not going to say enlightening, but a matchstick that could light a fire for people to research, develop their level of knowledge, geopolitical events around the world, not just the Middle East, but all over the world, and to hopefully take action. Um, specifically, we were talking about allies left behind in Afghanistan, and if you want to learn more about the efforts to help those individuals, you can check out saveourallies.org. Uh, interestingly enough, right now, they are also working over in Israel. Thank you again for listening to Change Agents, an Ironclad original presented by Montana Knife Company. We'll be back next week with an all-new episode.